Well, if you were here last week, um, I began a new series of messages uh, called Prophetic Voices, and we spoke about Jeremiah becoming a prophetic voice, and, and I want to continue along those lines, so as Pastor Abel uh, announced to everybody, all my, uh, my, some of my points are on there, but all the scriptures are on there as well, on that Bible app. You can even put your own notes in there and make the sermon better, and then maybe I can steal some of your stuff for next Sunday, okay? <laughs> so, so the debate happened last Tuesday night. And right away it gets somber. The debate happened last, last Tuesday night. Um, and immediately after the pundits and all the different sides to the equations of our nation began to speak. Um, and the division just grew stronger over a week. The hate continues to grow darker in our nation. And our nation continues the, the, uh, the pulling away from godly principles. Uh, this week, uh, Pastor Juan and I and Pastor Abel, Pastor Eli from our Tri-Cities campus in Wino, we went to a conference in San Antonio of, with pastors and leaders. And one of the pastors uh, said this. He said um, that when judgment comes upon a nation, it always begins with the leadership of the nation. Meaning, meaning that God, before he judges a nation, he will judge the leaders of the nation. And, and I think that we can see that quite clearly, that, that there is judgment upon the leadership of our nation. And of course, the Bible, if you read in the book of Hebrews, it states that when judgment starts in, the, in, in a nation, it also begins in the house of God. And maybe, just maybe, I want you to hear me out before you start dismissing what I'm about to say. Maybe we've come into a time of judgment, both in our nation and in the body of Christ. Um, this judgment is connected, I believe, with a shaking that is beginning to happen in the nation, a shaking that's happening within the body of Christ in our nation. And the Bible also continues to, to say that the things that God will shake, he will shake so that what's unshakable remains because the kingdom of God is unshakable. Amen. Meaning this, that we are about to see who is who in the church. I would be foolish to think that everybody that's here and everybody that's watching online is truly serving the Lord. And when it's time for shaking in the body of Christ, we get to see real attitudes come out. Amen. We get to see truth come out. And so I believe that we are stepping into a season where God is about to expose. And if you've been paying any attention to anything that's been going on in the, in the church of America today, beginning in January till now, God has just been exposing sin in his church. And there is a high demand for strong, godly leadership in our nation, but there's also been a lack of supply. And it's time for the sons and daughters of the kingdom of God to speak prophetically into this culture that we are a part of. Yeah. I want to remind you what I taught you last week. The prophetic builds, encourages, and comforts. And so when we use our prophetic voice, we speak words from the spirit that have the ability to give hope and give faith. You see, the prophetic doesn't spew out words of hate and condemnation the prophetic builds and comforts and encourages because you can't hate somebody to heaven. And I want to remind you that when you are born of the Spirit, when you are saved, God places eternity in our hearts. And because God's presence is supernatural, because his nature is supernatural, he is also multidimensional and multifaceted, meaning he can reveal things to us that others don't see. And right when you think you know everything there is to know about God, God will show you a new face of his glory, a new part of his presence so that you can grow deeper into his presence. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. amen. And if you're going to be a prophetic voice, I got to warn you, I feel the power of God this morning. You must know what and who you carry inside of you. Because before you can truly speak prophetically, you will go through the pain of separation. The pain of separation, meaning that when God wants to begin using you, he will separate you from family. He will separate you from friends. He will create new relationship, new threads of people that will speak into your life. Because not everybody will want to go with you where God wants you to go. 
and there will come moments, whether you're young or old, that there will be the pain of separation, that people that you want to hold on to will leave you because God has taken you to another level. Listen, here's the big idea today, the one thing that I want you to hold on to. Prophetic voices think differently, therefore they speak differently. They stand apart. They stand apart. They're just people who speak prophetically and think prophetically are different from other people. Even within the church, they stand apart. They don't comment like everybody else. They don't worship like everybody else. They don't praise like everybody else. And they don't care if everybody else judges them. They stand apart. Now, I want to remind you what I spoke last week due to many hundreds of years of rebellion. God raised up King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon to destroy Jerusalem, to destroy the temple, to burn the walls down and take thousands of captives from Jerusalem and Judah all the way to Babylon. And Jeremiah told them, get comfortable because you're going to be there for 70 years. It's not going to be a quick deliverance. And while you're there, dig roots, build houses, have kids, have grandchildren, and pray for the peace and blessing of your city. Because if your city has peace and your city is blessed, you will have peace and you will have blessed. You will be blessed. Now, as I teach today, okay, I, I, I didn't even get halfway through my message in Spanish service, so I probably won't get halfway through it today. But as I teach today, I want you to compare what I'm going to teach you that happened thousands of years ago to what is happening today in America. I want you to make a comparison in your mind. So I want you to get that Bible app out or your regular Bible. And we're going to read starting in Daniel chapter 1. You see, because we are going to be introduced to four young men, and these four young men were taken captive, and Nebuchadnezzar had a chief of staff, and he gave the chief of staff some instructions. And so I want you to read along with me, starting in verse 3, the king ordered Ash, Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Now watch this. Select only strong, healthy and good-looking young men. I think he's talking about the guys from Restore City Church. <laughs> Come on, man. You should say a strong amen. <laughs> Select only strong, healthy, good-looking young men. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. Verse 5. Oh, yes, verse 5. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years. How many years? Three years. And then they would enter the royal service. The king understood something very powerful. If his kingdom would stand, if he wanted legacy, he needed to invest in the next generation. The churches that are dying in America failed to pass the baton from one generation to the next. We can't hold on to leadership forever as older people. So Nebuchadnezzar understood a, a, a great leadership principle that if his kingdom was going to last, he needed to invest in the next generation. He needed to train them, indoctrinate them convince them, equip them, and empower them. And he tells his chief of staff to get the best and brightest of the Jewish young men who were all, by the way, under the age of 20. And his instruction is, train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. Now, in order to understand his reasoning, we first have to understand Jewish culture in the Old Testament because the core social structure in those days for the Jews was the family. As early as age five, children were taught the prayers of faith. They were taught to memorize them. The importance of the Sabbath was taught to them. They were taught about the glory of the tabernacle, the glory of Mount Sinai, and the glory of the temple. They were taught how to pray in the morning and pray in the afternoon and pray before you go to bed. They were taught how to pray for their food and pray for their family. They were instructed and taught about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, and the Exodus. They were taught about the, the Ten Commandments. They were taught about all the miracles of God. And Deuteronomy 4, 9, through Moses, God tells them, I want you to honor our traditions of faith and never forget how I rescued you, and I want you to pass this tradition on to your children and to your grandchildren. The Jewish people in those days understood that 
It was their responsibility to teach their kids and say, this is our God and this is how our family operates. We are sons and daughters of Yahweh first and foremost, and then we belong to our family. We are this. I don't care what your teachers teach you at school. I don't care what your friends tell you who you are and what they are. We are this. Before we are Alvarado, we are children of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Before we are Hispanic, we belong to the kingdom of God. Not backwards, because today you have a lot of people that put their family surname, they put their traditional uh, culture before being part of the kingdom of God. But in those days, they put God first and everything next. And they said, this is who we are. We are this. I don't care what anybody else is like. And if you're a parent who has had kids, your kids come home from school with different attitudes, with different behaviors. They say, well, so-and-so is like this and so. And how many of you have ever said, I don't care what they are. This is who we are. Can I get an amen if you've ever told your kids that? We are this. And listen to me, family, before you can do anything great in your life, you need to be convicted of your true identity. And this is shaped first and foremost through the family. And unfortunately, many dads and moms have not taken their role of teaching kids about who they are, so the school system and social media has had to do it. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. The school and social media should not be the first ones to teach your kids about sex. Parents are the first ones that should teach their kids about sex. And although as a nation, Israel had rebelled, nonetheless, even from a young age, they were taught about God and they were told that they were supposed to be separate from other nations. And they had this attitude. Listen to me. It's not an attitude of superiority. It's we are not the same. We are not the same. We're different. I love you, but we are not the same. And Nebuchadnezzar knew this. He knew Jewish culture. He knew their tradition. He knew the power of their God. He had heard the stories of the Red Sea. He had heard the stories of the Jordan River. He had heard the story of Joshua telling the sun, stand still so that I can defeat this enemy. So therefore, he instructed his leaders to strip away the faith and identity of these young men. Let's indoctrinate them with our culture, with our ways, our traditions. And the more they are exposed to Babylon, the more they will get comfortable in Babylon, leave their faith tradition, and then they will become like us. They were taught the language, the customs, the religion, and education of the Chaldeans, which was Babylonian culture. This included astronomy, astrology, magic, witchcraft, and the worship of other gods. They were instructed in the values of that nation, and what they had learned about Yahweh was being stripped away day by day over a period of three years. Now listen to what I'm about to teach. He even changed what was part of their core identity, which was their name. See, in Jewish culture, it's not like today where you go to a book of names, and you're this, no, I don't like that. No, I, oh, that's disgusting. I don't like that. I don't like that. No, oh, oh, yeah, that's it. You see, in Jewish culture, they didn't do that. They named their kids according to destiny and legacy and purpose. So it didn't matter if the name was popular or not. It meant something. It was, about, it was a prophetic name about what they were going through and where they were going. And so there was four men that we are going to read about. One was named Daniel, one was named Hananiah, one was named Misael, and one was named Azariah. Now, I want to introduce you to what their names mean. Daniel means God is my judge. God is my judge. Hananiah means Yahweh has been gracious. Misael, which is an amazing name, it means who is what God is, of course. If you don't know, that's my real name, Misael. Who is what God is? Come on, just don't don't strike me down, Lord. I'm just, my dad named me that. And Azariah means Yahweh has helped. Now, I want you to know that it was very important 
for parents to put a measure of God's name inside the name of their kids. That was core part of their identity as well. The name of my God is found within my name. It has purpose. It has meaning. And so Nebuchadnezzar knows that because he knew the Hebrew culture and he knew the Hebrew language. So he says, I'm going to start by stripping away their core identity by giving them new names. So Daniel went from God is my judge to Belteshazzar, meaning the lady protects the king. I'm going to go there in a second, but he went from a masculine name to a feminine name. He was given a trans name. Oh, I just got your attention. Good. (laughs) Hananiah went from Yahweh has been gracious to Shadrach, meaning I am fearful of God. So instead of approaching God who has given me grace, I am now afraid of God. Misael, who means who is what God is, went to Meshach, which means I am no one. I am despised and humiliated. He went from being confident in being like God to being a nobody. And Azariah, who means Yahweh has helped, is now the servant of the god Nebo, Abednego. And these names were purposely given to strip away their identity. Stay with me. I'm almost halfway. Um, the He wanted to force a new identity on them, try to cause them to think differently and give in to their emotions and feelings. See, because I'm sure that he said, if we can change the way they think, listen to me, then we can change their behavior. Because behavior always starts in the mind. It doesn't start with the action, it starts with the thought. So if I can change the way they think, I can change their behavior we can make them think that they are something that they are not, then we can control them. Ladies and gentlemen, times have not changed. The spirit of that age is once again moving in this age. This demonic, and listen to me when I tell you, this demonic spirit that tried to take the identity away from these four young men is moving greatly in our time and is attacking our kids and our young adults. It doesn't really attack us who are older. If you're about 50 and over, it's not going to attack us anymore. We are cemented. Gen X and the generations before, we are cemented in who we are. We are not the future of America. We are the present of America. The future of America is younger. And so this spirit attacks the younger people. It's found in the schools every week. This demon spirit is found in the education system. It's found on social media when kids and teenagers and young adults are on social media all day, every day. And this agenda used to be hidden, but now it's completely open. One that tries to confuse our kids about their gender and their identity. Put your seatbelts on because I'm about to offend somebody. There's a reason why Nebuchadnezzar changed Daniel's name from a masculine name to a feminine name. He wanted him to confuse. He wanted to confuse his his identity based on a feeling. He wanted to confuse Daniel and make him feel from a man to a woman. He wanted to confuse Hananiah, Misael, and Azariah. If I can get them to listen to their feelings, if I can get them to see that they are different than what God has said about them, I can change them. If I can get them young, if I can get them when they're forming who they are, I will get them to make decisions that can't be reversed. If I can sexualize them before they have developed critical thinking skills, I can pervert what God has created. If I can convince them that true freedom is living without restraint, then I can control their future and destroy their legacy and destroy their nation. Family, this demonic agenda. All right, again, seatbelts. I love you. I love you enough to tell you what the Spirit of God is saying. Family, this demonic agenda is found in schools, universities, government offices, after school programs, TV, the media, Hollywood, music, and all of this is intertwined with the occult and witchcraft. Now, I'm not the guy to tell you who to listen to and who not to listen to. I'm not the conspiracy theory guy, but you Swifties better pay attention to what the demon spirit is doing to her. You better watch it. You better be careful, Swifties. You better be careful what you're listening to, everybody else, because it is tied to a demonic agenda. When boys and men are allowed to identify as female to play in sports uh, and dominate sports in another gender because they're not good enough in their own gender, something is wrong. 
when bathrooms have no rule of law and you are punished for speaking against it, the spirit of Babylon is at work in America. When demonic rituals are part of concerts, the enemy has grown more bold. And this is why God told Israel, I need you to be separate. I need you to be different. It's not that I'm trying to control you. It's because I know you're not strong enough to resist the temptation. And this was Nebuchadnezzar's agenda. Remove godly identity and replace it with a demonic identity. Listen to me. Desensitize godly people and make sin normal. This is not a popular message in America. And I've, if I've offended you, I will not ask you to forgive me. You can ask God to forgive you. But here's the good news. Nebuchadnezzar underestimated these four guys. He underestimated them. He tried to give them new names. He tried to school them in the language and customs. But he didn't realize that within those who are separated, there's another group who are called the remnant. That there is a separation. Remember, I told you there's a separation happening within the body of Christ from the real believers to the false believers. The sheep and the goats are being separated right now. Because there were thousands that were taken captive, yet these four stood out. They were distinguished. You see, Nebuchadnezzar ordered, I want you to wine and dine them with the best food from my table. I want to entice them with the best that I can give to them. Because if you consume what I give you, you will feel good and not feel any need to change. But I love Daniel 1, verse 8. Check it out. But Daniel was determined. Somebody say determined. Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. You see, because God's laws even entered into dietary laws for the Jews. And Babylon had no restrictions. Daniel discerned the situation even as a young person under the age of 20. And he determined in his heart that he wasn't going to eat what everybody else in the church was eating. Because remember, he, they're, they're not training Babylonians. They're training young Jewish men. And so he determined, I'm not going to eat and consume and believe everything that these guys are believing. Because within the group that says we are not the same, there's another group that says we're really not the same. We're really not the same. Daniel determined, I'm not going to be that way. And so he tells the chief of staff, listen, test us for 10 days and let them eat their nice food and whatever they want to eat. And me and my four and my three buddies, we're just going to eat veggies, which uh, praise God that he doesn't put me through that testing. <laughs> praise God. He can put my wife through it, but not me. Give me carne and give me uh, steak. Come on, somebody. Give me some ribeye. Test me with ribeye, Lord. Test me with ribeye. And, and the chief of staff was like, dude, you, you need to understand. Now, here's the cool thing. If you continue reading, God gave Daniel great favor in the culture. You see, we think that we'll only be rejected, but when you really do what God asks you to do, God will grant you favor in places that nobody else has favor. So he gave him favor. And the chief of staff says, listen, if this comes out bad, go ahead, go ahead and put her up, Mario, please. Because uh, I sound better when Lisa is right there playing. Right. And so, and so um, he's like, let's do this for 10 days. And I promise you, chief of staff, that after 10 days, me and my buddies, we're going to look stronger and healthier than everyone who consumed the meat of Babylon. And so the chief of staff said, all right. And after 10 days, they looked better, they were stronger, they were built different. And I believe that he said this, because you didn't deposit my faith and identity in me, you can't take them away from me. 
I'm sure Daniel had that attitude. You didn't give me my faith and you didn't deposit my identity in me. God did. So because you didn't give it to me, you don't have the authority to take it away from me. You can give me a new name. You can put me in a different culture. You can try to make me miserable, but you can't touch what God has put inside of me. And I believe that we're living in a season and a time where people need to get sick and tired of being like everybody else. Where we, we say it's okay to be different. And God bless these young men because they decided they were, they were going to hold on to their identity while still learning the culture around them. See, I'm not, a, you know, there's Christians that are weird. Right? That everything is super prophetic for them and they're like, ooh, I feel the atmosphere and I, I, I can't be there. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm, I'm not talking about being a weird Christian. Those people are weird. They're just weird. I don't want them here. They're weird. I'm talking, I'm talking about knowing who God created you to be, knowing you have been gifted and anointed, and anointed, and being able to walk in a dark room and dominate the darkness. Where the people around you say, hey, you're different. Separated from the separation you know, we were, we were at this conference, I, I got to close, and, and you got to know that Pastor Juan, Pastor Abel, and I, and we know, and, and we indoctrinated Pastor Eli. He's not used to us. We're, we're, we're a little crazy when we hang out. We're loud. Um, we're super saved, though. <laughs> we're praying for we know, but the rest of us. And we sat for, for, for two days at this conference. We sat in the same row. And, and we're worshiping the Lord. We're having a great time. We laughed so much on this trip and ate some great food. And, and the, last, the last day, there was this couple that sat in front of us the entire conference. And finally, the guy turns around and looks at Pastor Juan. He goes, where are you guys from? You guys are different. He's like, oh, we're from Restore City in, in Washington. Oh, you're the group that we've heard about from Washington. You guys are different. And I was pretending that I wasn't hearing right. Have you ever been like, she's also like that, where <laughs> you're pretending that you're not hearing, but you're being nosy. You're like this, looking around, but right here you're tuned in. <laughs> and your wife is talking to you and you're like, uh-huh, but you're hearing it over here. Come on, guys. Come on, guys, be honest. You have immunity in church. You have immunity in church. And then your wife says, did you, did you hear what I was saying? Right. And this guy was telling Pastor Juan, yeah, I've noticed you guys this whole conference. You guys are different. You guys, you guys are. And I don't know if they were, they were looking at the measure of the glory or the measure of the gut. I don't know. Because <laughs> we're all big boys. I think it's a little bit of both. But I close by simply reminding you. You see, we, we read in verse 17 that God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings and visions and dreams. Next week when you come, because you're going to come next Sunday. Can I get an amen? We're going to talk about how God will give us the gifts of the spirit to function in places that are difficult. When no one else has the answer, God will give you prophetic gifts to be a solution to the problems at work. Don't ever be the problem. Be the solution. And so I'm, I'm, here to, I'm here to remind young and old alike, we are not the same as this world. We are powerful, we are anointed, we can change this world. We are sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a people belonging to God. You carry the spirit of Jesus inside of you and the blood of Jesus flows through your veins. Understand who you are and what you carry. I'm reminded what Paul told Timothy, his protege. Timothy, guard the good deposit that was given to you by God. Guard that deposit, that spirit of faith that's inside of you. Protect it. Don't just give it away. You've been given identity by God. You've been given gifts of the spirit. Protect them so that no matter what this world tells you, you are not moved. And I just wonder if there's anybody here that understands what God is trying to say to your life. And I've come to challenge this church. 
this church by now should be double of what it is today. Now, we're growing, don't get me wrong, and we're not the best church in, in America or Moses Lake, but I'm here to tell you that God is breathing on this church right now. You need to go out there and invite people to come with you and get in God's presence so that they get their hearts right with God. 